Good evening, buenas tardes. This is Malta Moreno Vega, Creative Justice Initiative founder and president. Uh, welcome to a discussion uh, with my sisterhood. Um, and this panel of emerging uh, established and emerging uh, community-based organizations um, comes from a series of conversations I've had uh, with different institutions, right? And we can look at this emergence of uh, established institutions as well as community-based institutions in terms of private and public spaces. Who supports large so-called historic traditional institutions? Who supports small, smaller emerging institutions? Who values what? What are the criteria for um, support for large institutions and small institutions? And it's curious because it really, there is no criteria. It's the criteria of whoever is the funder from a public level or from a private level. And I remember being, uh, as a matter of fact, with Lori Cumba, who's on the panel, and I'll introduce the panel in a moment, but I want to give you food for thought. Um, and I was part of the Radical Latina exhibition. And I asked the question of the president of the institution, uh, have you partnered with community-based institutions in the area? And the answer was no. And I recently talked to a curator at the Whitney and uh, that is doing an exhibition, right? On uh, the effects and the impact of the hurricane of Puerto Rico and Maria and Irma on the lives of Puerto Ricans. And um, I asked the same question, what partnerships are you doing with emerging community-based institutions? And the response was the same, none. In the period of diversity, in the period of uh, demographic changes, right? How is that still possible? How is that still possible that people are not uh, partnering, collaborating with people who subject matter and cultural matters they are dealing with or attempting to deal with? So that's food for thought. So let me uh, introduce our panel. I'm so excited. Uh, Diane James, President and CEO of St. Croix Foundation for Community Development. Um, U.S. Virgin Islands, serving the U.S. Virgin Islands. Diane, thank you so much for being with us. We have Lori Combo, a New York Commissioner of Cultural Affairs and founder and executive director of MOCADA. We also have Sarah Herman, art historian, curator, and professor. She is chief curator of Centro Leon in Santiago, Dominican Republic. And um, where's my Mina? And we have um, Mina, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, Jagna, um, who is a lawyer, a civil rights activist, and um, very involved in the arts and art advocacy. And we have uh, Mariel Hernandez Romero, a Black Puerto Rican, Afro-feminist, and um, scholar, director of the Institute for the Construction of Racial Equity in the Americas, a part of the foundation, uh, the Community Foundation de Puerto Rico. So welcome all and thank you for joining us in this conversation. And what I'd like to share with the audience is basically that this is a conversation that is going to take different parts and different sections because we want it to be a pan-Caribbean conversation because we all understand that our colonial experience has been one that has separated us unnecessarily. And therefore we need to um, intentionally 
bring together our communities. And uh, we've been doing that and we've been working hard on that when I'm also the creator and founder of the Caribbean Cultural Center as uh, Lori is the founder and, and, and first president of, of Mokata. And our work has been diaspora work, right? In the city. But um, now being in Puerto Rico and based in Puerto Rico, the importance of uniting, right? Uh, the Caribbean in ways uh, that we have not previously. I know there have been attempts, but I hope that this attempt that we are doing together as a sisterhood and uh, with our brothers, we can begin to forge a more pan uh, diaspora, African diaspora reality, because we know that uh, different islands are seen differently and are supported differently and are valued differently. And that is unacceptable. We're one and the same. So I'd like to start with um, Sarah, who was talking about her experience mm -hmm. in New York. Uh, what <laughs> what did you note know in in your presentations and in your work in New, in New York and in the Caribbean that you're doing? I, I, Marta, primero que todo, thank you so much for having us and for having giving us the opportunity, the, the privilege to be of being together. Uh, we have to make sense together through dialogue, through reciprocity, and through uh, a horizontality to talk eye to eye to our uh, peers. Uh, and these things that we are going to talk today are needed to, to be talked, needed to, to be addressed, because we cannot keep silent anymore, these kind of things. Before I, I tell you a little bit about that experience, I, I want to say, uh, the, my place of work or and, and my place of uh, existential development. So you know where I talk from, from where I talk from. Absolutely. I work in, the, I work from the uh, Dominican Republic. I work in a cultural private institution located a uh, hundred and sixty five five kilometers from the capital city Santo Domingo, in the city of Santiago, which is the third city of importance in the, in the country because the second is Manhattan. And I live in a very violent and fragmented society, in a bipolar society with police brutality, with ras a, a, a racist society, with racial profiling. Uh, sometimes when we talk about that, we think that only happens in some parts of the developed world, but we live it uh, at very uh, in, in, the, in the extreme. And those are the communities that we need to serve. Those fragmented, by, violent uh, communities, those uh, communities that are at the base and the root of our work, those are the people that we need to serve. Um, I think we have to keep um, short this kind of uh, appreciations, but I, I think we, we also have to put into words on what we mean when we talk about uh, established and emerging institution. I have this, this saying, because I think our Caribbean societies have always been in a state of emergency. Uh, historically, uh, long after the, the, the rise and the, and the placement of the institutions, uh, in the Caribbean cultural system, uh, the institutions are in a state of emergency, in a state of crisis, like they are starting. Uh, I will give the example of very important institutions in the Caribbean that have been always in the, in a, in a, in the verge of a being uh, extinguished. And some of them are not longer there, like Carifesta, they have Anna Biennial, they have changed, like whoever knows to where, the Caribbean Biennials uh, and the, the Festivales de Puerto Rico in 1952, that was the, the origin to Carifesta. Mm. Those other, to all those events that were conceived to dialogue and to, with the purpose of union and cultural uh, correspondence have perished do the fragility of the cultural institutional system. Uh, 
the cultural system in the academia societies is very, very important. It's an axis in the economy. The, the contribution to the gross domestic product of the cultural se sector is huge. However, culture is not a priority to, for any government. So that's when, it, when the private and the public comes into turn. How do you negotiate that? How do you negotiate that? Because it's the same bipolar situation of the, of the society. How do you uh, establish a relationship with the private sector to the public in the cultural fear field in the search of these emerging initiatives? There has been a tradition, as I said, of negotiate, negotiation between this, uh, these two uh, spaces. And also there is a story of antagonism because the private sector wouldn't let go their assets for, to the private sector and the private sectors, you know what happens when that happens. So we so need Sarah, to- Sarah, let, let um, Diane yeah. come in, uh, because uh, I remember attending Cari Fiesta in Cuba. That's when I first uh, encountered it. And I think it was a very important uh, no festival because it brought together the African diaspora of the Caribbean specifically, but also many of us went in from the state side and from Europe and so on. How do you see the, this private sector dynamic working, Deanne? Because here we are in the Caribbean together and those things that could bring economy, stability to some of our institutions and organizations are not there any longer. Um, you know, it's a, it, we live under the umbrella of colonization still. And so um, I think the colonial landscape of particularly the U.S. Caribbean, um, I always uh, expand out to even include Guam because they get left out and um, their issues are um, on par with ours in terms of the ways in which um, investments are flowing uh, to cultural uh, institutions in um um, in that part of the world as well. But, um, you know, like I, I always say that there's, there's um, oftentimes uh, we have become good stewards of uh, capitalism and of colonization. And so how we as, um, as, as territories, as colonies have built our own um, communities and economies um, has been so deeply informed by um, by colonization that we don't make strategic decisions um, around how to direct uh, and how to uh, engage private sector in the way that we need to to support our own and to support our own interests. And so I, I don't know like how things are in Puerto Rico, but I know in the Virgin Islands we struggle with our political leadership to make the kinds of economic decisions that ensure that you know the cultural and heritage assets of the territory are prioritized. So like, I don't know how to answer that question other than um, then we still sort of operate under the umbrella of colonization and that has in so many ways, um, it's stifled. Um, our evolution and growth and the preservation of our, you know, our cultural, you know, assets. And that's uh, something that we as a, a nonprofit organization, as a place-based foundation, are working sometimes it feels single-handedly and without a, a, a lot of support from other community stakeholders to make uh, a case for deeper investments. Um, from private sector, both nationally and even local private sector in um, the work that we're trying to lift up. I don't know if that answers your question, but that is... Um, well, and it, it brings a very important point, right? That we mm -hmm. talk about our islands, Puerto Rico, St. Croix, and so on, and the umbrella of colonialism um, is often set aside in our conversations and not centered. Right, because if you're a colony, what is the role of a colony to the person or to the uh, quote empire that owns it? 
right? Mm -hmm. There, there is a relationship there, and it goes to Sarah's point. There is a dichotomy there of the of, of relationship and of value and of understanding. You know, does the empire develop it, it, it or it uh, makes it dependent? It's uh, colonies. And if it does so under what conditions, right? It almost reminds me of uh, of uh, now this colonization in the arts process where objects are being returned to Africa, right? They were stolen, right? And the negotiation is still the major institutions owning the object, right? And telling the people who created it, well, you're not ready yet to take care of your objects. So let, let us oversee them for you and care for them, although you created it, right? So it's that same mentality of um, abuse, right? It's the same mentality of abuse in the arts as well as in, in, the, um, in, in the relationship of what is valued and what is understood as being valued and how uh, foundations invest. And that's curious because like I see more investment now by uh, private foundations in Puerto Rico than I've seen uh, historically since I've been involved in the arts and that's going back to when I was director of Emerson del Barrio, the second director of Emerson del Barrio, where um, we negotiated with the Met uh, an exhibition that was uh, co-developed, or it was developed by El Museo del Barrio, but we didn't have the money to do it. So we coerced the Met to invest in that exhibition. And that was during the period, and I'm going to um, Mina with this, right? That was during the period where uh, Harlem on My Mind had just happened. And black artists were picketing the Met because none of their work is, was inside the Met, only Van der Sea's work, uh, a photographer that was deceased. And when Holding, as uh, president and director of the Met, was questioned by the press, he says, well, we don't need the art. Harlem is the art, right? And there was only posters for the Harlem on my mind. So that same mentality of colonialism, right? And who is valued and what can go into these walls and what is valued in these walls and who provides money for these uh, objects that go in uh, are created. And you have like a, a, a way of thinking about a community, Amina, and the work that you have done, if you can sort of share it with us. Yeah, uh, picking up from Sarah's example, um, I am uh, primarily probably going to be speaking from my experience um, from Community Justice Project, which is based in Miami, very um, at home with Caribbean people over here. And more recently, I did move to, to Harlem, so I have my own now Caribbean community up there. So um, uh, yeah, but actually, you know, it's interesting that you start talking about Harlem on my mind and the Met because um, one of the things that we did here at Community Justice Project was actually um, uh, inspired by the protest of the Whitney Biennial that happened a couple of years ago because the the board member was, um, I think he was a board member of a, of a arms company and, uh, and some prominent artists decided to boycott the Biennial wh while smaller artists, one of which is actually a Miami artist, you know, they, they, they felt like they didn't have a choice but to, but to go and participate. And part of our thinking, so we created an artist residency program a bit later, but part of our thinking was, you know, how can we as a community organization, as, I mean, we're a lawyer, we are a legal organization actually, but um, as a legal organization or as a community organization, how can we actually support our artists in making art alongside and with and for the communities that they that they want to that they represent that they're from without having to compromise on their values you know and without having it to be be without the the only people buying their art being developers that are gentrifying their neighborhoods you know so so part of what um we are have been trying to do there and that we continue to try to do is to say you know, how is it that we as a legal organization and as an organization that's very 
linked with different kinds of community organizations that are seeking transformative justice? How can we um, uh, work with artists to one, help them translate the critique that is in their pieces into actual policy change and into things that will hopefully support the communities that they're seeking to represent. But then two, how can, um, by investing in and by supporting um, artists that, that want to work alongside communities and that are from uh, the communities that we work in, how can we actually contribute to the production of pieces that you know, like really speak for the voices of the folks that we work with. How can, like, we work with filmmakers from Haiti and, and um, I mean, they're Haitian, Haitian American, I guess, um, and uh, as well as uh, other parts of um, the African American community and other communities here that, um, you know, go into these communities and, you know, they, they are representing the voices of mobile home park uh, uh, residents and people who are being evicted and, um, you know, uh, folks that were that were impacted most uh, seriously by the pandemic, and this, you know, it's I think for us, uh, it's it's both the recognition that the law itself it does a violence to these communities, and so that we as lawyers actually um, don't want the only experience that they have with us to be that right, a stripped down version of their story, but rather, you know, we would like to see how we can use poetry and arts and all, all different kinds of forms of art to help to, to, you know, not help people, but so that people can actually tell their stories themselves without, without it, like the only record of the story being, you know, a declaration in an eviction proceeding or something like that. So, um, I mean, I'll keep it brief there. We can talk about, about that a little bit more, but I think, um, I think, you know, this question of where the money comes from and how we as community organizations can actually work together with artists to um, to really produce the work that is needed in order to um, like like spark the conversations that that um, are going to be the basis of you know systemic change is like that's kind of what what it is that we're looking for and we're, we're experimenting with. Well, one of the things that, you know, occurs to me and it keeps occurring to me, right? Um, we're community-based institutions and many of us who have been working at community-based institutions and are committed to that as the framework of how institutions should be, right? Uh, because we're in a critical moment. We're in a critical moment in terms of the reality of the times because of climate the reality of the times in the United States, because uh, who knows what the next political uh, reality will be and how it will affect our audience. And who controls uh, the voice in the arts, right? Because generally art groups are seen as marginal. Although we're on the front lines of civil rights, racial rights, housing rights, and uh, when institutions like, um, well, let's not name institutions, the larger institutions get mega funding to replicate the type of work that we are doing as entertainment, right? Right? Um, and I did mention the Whitney and the, and the hurricane because I think that there's something to be said about co-optation, right? Um, and not using and not collaborating with the groups that have done this work historically. And um, now all of a sudden are doing it and are getting whatever resources that a smaller group would not get to do it, right? So what? how do we change that dynamic? Because right now our communities are in danger. With climate control, most of our communities are on the front lines, right? Uh, most of our communities are on the front line with censorship. The books that are being removed uh, or attempted to be removed are from our authors. Does that also happen to the visual arts that um, then become attacked and censored? So how do, you know, in this new emerging uh, confrontational reality, do we begin to address those issues? And going back to Sarah, how do we address them when most of the income producing activities that our islands had have fallen apart, have been fractured, 
right? So Sarah, you want to continue with your point? Yes, I, I, I would like to address something that, that emerged from what Mina was saying as well, is because it is important to think as well and how, uh, on how institutions, not only our institution, but other institutions, mostly mainstream, make uh, knowledge public. And of course, understanding knowledge in, in, in its ample sense. And when I say make it public is an art exhibition, for example. Um, we have come to realize that suddenly in the University of Zurich and the University of Oslo are studying a, I may say, say Derek Walcott, a Franz Fanon, a Juan Bosch, Nicolas Guillén, a Pedro Alviso Campos. This, from a, uh, they, they're bringing that content to us, translated to some purposes that we cannot even identify at this moment. And this is a very dangerous situation. Not only are we are in a crucial time where information is being managed and what a friend of mine call it, uh, we are building an anti-archive. And, and not only the predecessors' uh, thoughts are being uh, denied, not only history um, is being erased, but we are being taken uh, of our own producers of sense. So suddenly I start, I think we have to look at that with a lot of suspicion. Suddenly that a visual studies class in the middle of nowhere in Lund, Sweden, I don't have anything against that mm -hmm. university mm -hmm. or something, mm -hmm. but, but it's start reading uh, Franz Fanon. Oof. And they start to, to make their own conclusions. I think one of, what is good about this kind of discussions is that we come to terms to the idea that we need not only to systematize what we have done in a very serious way. We have to be very serious on systematizing, not only the, the fights, uh, but what we have written, what we, what we have said. So nobody comes to, to, to quote us uh, without the permission to do it. But we have to also make it public. Do this that we are doing this uh, at this moment. Uh, because yes, we need to say, I, I have said this and I have fought like Marta. I, like Marta said, I have been in the climax of the civil uh, right movement. And this is another moment of our civil right uh, fight. Maricela, I see you nodding your head, but no ha dicho nada. <laughs> No, I was waiting for your for your call. So thank you for for the invitation and the talk. Um, I th I'm listening to you all. Um, I like I, I've been noticed like we have like a, talking about uh, established institutions, but we are kind of ignoring uh, the the role that the government plays here. Too. So that's the most established institution that we need to also. Uh, target uh, in this uh, shift of mentality of what is crucial, you know? And also, uh, before we start the, the live, uh, we mentioned about how we could produce a certain mentality uh, that keep the bridge between organ community organization and established or emerging institution. And here in this conversation, we are meeting community leaders that are doing the, the, the job in our community. So, so that is something very important that we need to have in consideration when we are doing this stuff. Um, based on my experience uh, uh, and what I'm observing from Puerto Rico is that, yes, we have a sub uh, organization, but that we are emerging organization, but in the case of Puerto Rico, what I have noticed is that the same people that is working in the established organization are working in the emerging 
organization. So they are keeping like they are like at the gatekeeper. They confirm what is art, what is culture, and what is value as culture. So we also need to question that and and how the funding, why they are getting also the funding in the emerging and the established. So those are my my thoughts for that. So Laurie Campbell, I let you sort of lay back a bit because you came running through the door. <laughs> so um, you and I have been in the trenches, you as my mentee. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, for me, you and Deanne represent the same generation of leadership, right? In the head now, you are the... Uh, Department of Cultural Affairs of New York, and the end, uh, the head of the Cultural Foundation or the foundation that also deals with culture on St. Croix, right? And what relationship, in terms of what she was talking about, do you see with New York? Because New York is like the Caribbean island, mm -hmm. right? And well, you are now the commissioner of arts, uh, uh, of culture, actually, uh, in in New York. So, what what relationship do you see? What connections do you see? Or what collaborations do you see? Well, first, I want to say I'm really excited to be on this panel. Um, I wanted to let you all know this panel is also streaming live on the Department of Cultural Affairs social media platforms. So, I want everyone to be aware of that because. Um, it's another audience that we should also be working with and educating about a lot of these types of conversations that we are having. I also wanna say that there is, and I believe this uh, like deep in my soul, and I think that's why I connected with Martha. It's so powerful when people of the African diaspora connect through the commonality of our African identity. I, I believe when we find more of the commonalities amongst ourselves, there's a certain power in that versus dividing ourselves as African people amongst who colonized us. Um, there's a place for that also because there are some individual experiences that have happened in our prospective countries and our prospective lands um, that will allow us to become tribal. But I think it's really important that we take opportunities such as this to recognize our African diaspora um, heritage and where we all stem from. I think uh, one of the things that Martha has spoken a lot about is the dynamics between culture and government and arts and culture. What I will say, and this is so ironic, that of being the executive director of an African diaspora museum, for 15 years, I've never been on a call like this. I've never been on a Zoom like this, right? I was in my little bubble and in my own little silo, imagining what the world of the African diaspora looked like. But the ability to pull together leaders uh, from the various aspects culturally all throughout the world is really very powerful. And we should take full adv advantage of Zoom and all of these other platforms to bridge those African diaspora leaders that are leading cultural institutions that are leading this work because there's so much that we can do internally in terms of shared exhibitions, shared spaces, shared conferences, shared catalogs, shared merchandise, shared archives. There's a lot of work that we can do um, to really realize the potential of the power of the African diaspora. And the power is really the interconnectedness and the reconnecting of one another and understanding our plights, um, relatively speaking. Martha has sent, and we've spoken about this, but also, and I know you're gonna speak more to this, but it speaks to um, what all of you have been speaking about um, in terms of what's happening in our prospective countries. So with what Congress member uh, Barbara Lee just put out in terms of an opportunity to pass legislation on equality throughout the, the arts community throughout the United States, how powerful would that be if we took this legislation that Congress member Barbara Lee put forward and that it's not just a New York based uh, legislative uh, initiative, but this is something that all of the organizations throughout the diaspora not only sign on to that, 
but demand that same level of support, that same level of equality in our prospective countries. And if we can join forces around that and have broader conversations to say, she has done something very bold on the federal level, this needs to create the platform all across the nation and all throughout the African diaspora of what we've been calling for. So I think when we look at that, that's really very powerful. I also think that from my experiences, I came into this work with a different perspective on this. And now that I've been a museum leader, a city council member, and now a commissioner, I find that it's much more productive to advance what your community or your organization specifically needs. And I say that to say there's a there's a bit of a dangerous, I would say not dangerous in terms of it's it, it, it creates an unproductiveness of your time. It creates a danger when you compare yourself to another organization, another group, another community in terms of what one community is receiving and what another community is not receiving versus just putting forward very clearly, this is what my community needs. And so I have found in having to navigate large scale institutions, um, smaller institutions, but I say smaller only in size and budget, but not in terms of its impact and its importance and, and the work that they do is to be clear about the needs that they have from health insurance to retirement plans, to making sure that there's equitable programming in order to also be able to create uh, uh, opportunities to, for saving and investing and creating endowments for our organizations. We need to just globally come up with a platform of what is going to be needed for our communities to thrive culturally and you know, and you can read it in Congress member um, uh, Barbara Ann's um, testimony that this is gonna be a real powerful time for us to be able to come together around this legislation to make this mm -hmm. possible. So I'll just leave it there because I, I've got the memo in there that we've gotta be brief so that we can have more time for discussion. So, you know, I just think that we need to definitely get down with Congress member Lee and make sure that we promote what she's working on federally all throughout this country and the diaspora. So I would like to turn to, um, and this is supposed to be a conversation. You're all supposed to jump in. <laughs> so uh, Jump in, ladies, jump in. <laughs> Deanne, uh, how can, and, and I think we need to be uh, pragmatic about it and intentional about it, how, how do we assist you, right, or the foundation, right, in making certain things visible and certain things that will assist you as well assist us, right, in, in, bridging, um, in, in bridging the need for our communication, right, in terms of assisting each other? in reaching what, you know, Barbara Lee is talking about in her, in her legislation. I mean, cause we have to be intentional about it. We have to say like, what is one and two for that foundation and for the community in St. Croix that we can be of assistance of because we're gonna ask you for assistance when it comes to, it, it, to certain things, right? Because it's reciprocal. So I'm going to sort of drill it down to like where we work. We are a place-based organization. So we work with grassroots organization. My, my vocabulary, my perspective is framed because by that. Um, and one of the, the things that we've done over the, so the, the foundation is 31 years old. Um, we serve as a fiscal sponsor. We've served in that capacity for over 250 small grassroots initiatives and nonprofits. And so we have a really broad perspective on what, what the needs and assets of our community are. But five years ago, we made the decision to become more intentional about how we work with our nonprofits and created a consortium of nonprofits that um, started with about 50. Now there's about 30 um, formal members. And one, uh, we, we've done a lot of systems um, thinking work. And I, I think that is, um, for me as a leader, one of the greatest uh, professional development um, uh, assets that I have now and competencies that I've, I've been able to build because I, it, 
it helped me understand that everything is connected to everything. And so we can sit here and have a conversation about the arts, but um, the reality is, is that all of the sectors within the consortium, so we have arts and culture, we have youth and education, health and human services, and the environs, everything is connected to everything. And so one of the, the, the incredible um, points of like just uh, some wisdom that was given to us by the consultant that's been doing a lot of this systems um, change work with us is that the re that relationship is the resolution. And so, you know, like Lori was saying, the, the, the opportunity to have um, all of us and these voices in one room having this conversation is powerful. And we've learned that with our consortium of nonprofits that everyone was working in silos and the power that's been able to be generated by all of us coming together with a collective vision, collective, like just, you know, very common language, um, uh, working intentionally around collective impact is just, um, I, I, the work that I'm doing is so much transformed from what I was doing before. Um, the arts is centered in everything. It's, it's really powerful when, um, when organizations and, and stakeholders come together around uh, a vision of, of you know, really broad, deep social impact. Um, and all those voices um, inform the agenda. I think you have the opportunity to, to do really powerful work and, and to build um, uh, you know, sort of some agency for all of us um, uh, by working together in, I think, in different ways. And so I, I think these conversations are critical. I think um, place-based organizations, I am like a fierce advocate for place-based philanthropy and place-based nonprofits because those are the ones that are closest to the ground. They understand communities in ways that, you know, uh, community foundations, the bigger uh, community foundations don't understand, can't, don't really have their fingers on the pulse. And so when, you know, Lori was talking about how important it is for organizations um, and communities to understand what their needs are, to really frame those needs based on, um, you know, where uh, their stakeholders are and really taking the voice of those stakeholders into consideration as they're making the case for deeper investments and for, a, you know, a collective agenda. Um, I just I think it's about the it's about building relationships start first at the ground level in community grassroots level and then also in spaces like this where we can you know sort of find commonalities and um, sort of develop a uh, collective agenda around like how to move you know this work forward and to to to, uh, uh, to attract deeper investments in our community. I would like to jump in. Um, Dina, I will, I will send you an email uh, later to collaborate because the institute that I started directing uh, a week ago, uh, we are working the idea that Marta mentioned at the beginning, uh, a pan-African -Af pan diaspora community. And we are creating a, a network of communities organization, but also advocacy organization. And we are hoping to be a hub uh, where people can, uh, where we can facilitate uh, this collaboration between countries and communities uh, in the Caribbean and Latin America. So, so far we have Colombia confirmed a community, uh, a group of organizations from Colombia. We have Peru also jumping in the conversation, the network. And I'm looking for St. Croix now. So we are, trying to do that from uh, Fundacion Comunitaria, to have the hub that we can collaborate and help each other to advance uh, our, 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 our struggle, yes, I know, uh, to improve uh, the lifestyle of our people, our communities. No? So I will send you an email later, well, everybody, to, so you know a little bit about our, our organization. Well, I think that one of the things that uh, Sarah brought up, right, is that a lot of the efforts that have been started have disintegrated. So the question here, you know, and I go um, to you, Sarah, and also Mina, right, because of the legal aspect of it all. Um, how do you sustain, right, because we say it, 
right? I'm sure that networks before have emerged and they just haven't gone forward because who sustains them? What is the commitment to sustaining them, right? And how long is the support? Because one of the issues uh, that we need to talk about is that funding for a year, funding for two years, funding for three years is insufficient. Mm -hmm. We know no. that any big project, any big project, requires at least five years, if not eight years of support, at the minimum. Um, I, Marta, this is a very important thing because um, we, ha we have to start thinking about the, the systematization, as I said before, of all the endeavors and uh, production of, of thought and meaning that we always do. So, mm -hmm. Uh, the case of uh, uh, the Carifestas, the Festival de, uh, de las Artes de San Juan, uh, la, de, uh, la Bienal de Grabado, la Trienal Poligráfica, la Bienal del Caribe, all those events that were meant to establish a horizontality uh, in the Caribbean, that were meant to, put, to get us together, and did, we have to say that at that time, was, were circumstantially funded there was circumstances and there, it was because there was the 500 years of, of that guy that came here and colonized and or so and so event the independence of so and so so it was circumstantial and it, they were funded by governments as a one-time thing like let's do this let's take picture mm -hmm. let's do this so I have I uh, I happen to be in a very different different situation from you guys, since I am uh, supposedly in a democratic country in a shared island, um, and that this the the institutional system of the culture and the arts is is as I said before fracture. We have no cultural policy and no budget directed to, to the cultural sector with no legisl legislation that could actually um, help the cultural institution to survive and to work. So what can you expect? That means that the um, private sector sometimes has to take the role of doing that with no incentive and no nothing because there's nothing there. So it's a very a strange situation that we are, but we have the vocation, I think, of, of this Caribbean nomadic sense that make us like struggle. And, and as you said, what unites us all is actually our African uh, uh, heritage. It's not the Spaniards. To the, for, uh, the relationship to the Martinicans or the Guadalupe, the people from Guadalupe, it's not the Spanish. It's the African. It's not the Aboriginal because it's not even the same. So what unites the Caribbean is that. And I think um, maybe we shouldn't start thinking about those mega events, pan-Caribbean events that uh, plan to, as a world fair, to have a the little piece of everywhere, like mm -hmm. a zoo, mm -hmm. and start thinking about these little efforts that are huge. This panel today is huge, Marta. So let's start to talk about this like once a month. Mm -hmm. Let's start to address the things. Let's start to say which institutions are really uh, not not translating to say some in a way our contents in a dignified, to say the least, way. I Let's agree with you. I, talk, I think yeah. that one of the things that it, it is a reality, I don't think the United States has a cultural policy. What it has is institutions like the National Endowment, the National Endowment for the Humanities. It has like, let's say, the, the uh, Cultural Commission at, in different places and state councils in different places. But they don't have a unified cultural policy. Yeah. I don't think that Puerto Rico does either. Right. Uh, because if, if there were or let's say even taking it back and here we need your help, Mina, um, if, it, if there were, there would be a legal document. Right. 
that would address the, re the cultural reality of the nation and what that cultural reality is. For us, let's say stateside, it would be the constitution, which from inception, right, was racist. From inception was sexist, right? And um, I guess the, the the issue here, and and yes, you know, because I I am a product of the African diaspora, yes. But one of the unique things about the Caribbean is that it has people from uh, India, it has people from Asia, it has pe it, it is. I mean, when I went to Trinidad, the first time Surinam. I went to Trinidad, I knew the future of the world. The future of the world, when I saw Trinidadians, I was like, this is what the world will look like. Right? Yes. And what we're finding now in 2022 is that right. that constitution <laughs> is fighting against that, right? Because white supremacists who support the constitution are in fact saying, no, this is not what we want the country to look like. But it, what we represent is that, right? We represent that. We represent that. And anybody who looks at this panel and the composition of this panel sees all of that in our faces, mm -hmm. right? So that the question is that we understand a cultural policy that respects culture that respects the ethics, the aesthetic, the values that each of our groups bring. And how we translate that, how we narrate that, Sarah, right? And to uh, Mina's point, how does that get narrated across the arts? How does that get translated and made public throughout the arts? Because this is the moment when at least stateside the conversation is erased culture what does it mean erase culture it means erase this panel because that's what it means right erase us right and we represent our, our, our parties to this nation or products of this nation or products of colonization and it's saying erase us what is our narrative in the arts? What is our narrative in culture? And what is our policy as a, as a community, as a global community that represents the world in our veins? Because you can't go to Trinidad, you can't go to Syria, you can't go to Jamaica and not see the world in our veins. Mm. I love that. I mean, yeah, and, and my, you know, the, the sort of perspective through which I do my work is through is decolonization, you know, which is why I situate myself in this way alongside other communities that have experienced the violence of colonization in various forms. But, um, you know, to, it, there's a reason why the U.S. has not signed the International Covenant on uh, Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, you know, and, uh, and you, meanwhile, you see most of the states in the global south having, having ratified that, that, uh, that human rights convention. But um, but you know, just to go back to your to your question also about um, sustainability. I mean, I think that something that uh, also maybe goes to Marisel's point is that you know it is important to distribute funds and initiatives across non-traditional organizations, right? Community organizations, people who are deeply rooted in community uh, in community, are going to be the ones that will continue going back to the same artists that will continue to you know collaborate in ways that really um sort of bring the the most um sort of honest voices to the fore and uh and i think that part of what it is that the sort of ngo community needs to do is like to to almost like rethink even the way that um that they interact with artists because i think what i have seen unfortunately, in a lot of NGOs is a sort of transactional nature. It's like, you know, you you have a poet come, like you say a poem real quick, and then you go on to like do whatever it was that you were gonna do. And it's not, it's not necessary, the poet is not brought into the why of the organization, right? Or, or the why of the campaign or the, 
the protest or whatever it may be. And in fact, um, if we as community-based organizations actually thought of artists as organizers in their own right and, um, and actually incorporated or engaged in a process of building alongside um, artists, or like, you know, like my vision even at Community Justice Project was when we're in a community meeting with organizers and we're the lawyers, I'm like, let's have a poet, you know, or let's have a visual artist there so that in the same way as I filter whatever's going on through legal lens and the organizers are filtering through like their organizing campaign lens, the artists can filter it through that lens and bring that power to whatever it is that's going on. So I, I think I think that like, you know, shifting the way that people think about arts, like really making art, like thinking about arts and culture as integral to winning, winning campaigns, winning the things that we're looking for, like that kind of, of shift from thinking about it in a transactional way to like really thinking about it as like, how are we being transformed in the process? And then how is that transforming the way that we do our work? That will then help with the sustainability question because it becomes the way that we do our work, the way that we, we exist in community. And the only other thing that I was gonna say is that I think the other thing that I've really realized and you know, my colleague, um, Nadej, who's at CJP, she has really uh, brought this home is the importance of archiving um, and really writing our own history. So rather than having only the journalists come to the event and, you know, maybe write about it in the newspaper, it's like, what is it that we are remembering from that? How can we also visualize like all of the thinking and the work that went into putting up this event that then can be built upon, you know, when the next thing happens. And so, and that's also a way for, you know, funders, let's say, who say that they only want to fund this one little event. Like you, you have like a body of things to refer them to, to say, look, this work is long-term work. Like it, it's a five-year, you know, um, timeline. It's a 10-year timeline. And we, we can't, we can't think about this only in like episodic, like one event fat, like ways. We actually need to think about accompanying communities and accompanying this process of, of building culture and building um, narrative in this longitudinal fashion. Nina, I just wanted to, okay, go ahead. Uh, no, I was just gonna say, I think a bill of rights for the arts is, is sort of what I hear coming from you, Mina. Because I think that, you know, um, we as an individual group can say it to a funder, oh, we need 10 years of funding for this, you know, to, to take hold. But it's not going to make, it, 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 it doesn't resonate. What is resonating now is maybe two years, maybe three years. Right. You know, that's why I, I sort of put it out there, you know, when Maddie said, said, well, we're doing this. I'm saying, like, basically make sure that the support is there for this huge project. I mean, the, you know what I mean? It's one, it's a wonderful project, but what, let's not put out false promises to our own, right? And this has happened, I mean, again, this is where age is a benefit. When I came on the scene across the country, we had a diversity of institutions, not NGOs, community-based, grounded in community, right? all participating for the most part in justice work for their communities. Be they native, Asian, African, diaspora, Latino, however they identify, if there was a fever across the nation, right? That was grounded in culture, was grounded in productivity in the arts. Now, when we did the work last um, season, right? Around race, justice, myth, and art, we have less than half the institutions we had then, right? So then the question is who does the work? Because if you have less institutions and the work is, is being amplified, right? And it's being amplified by the call for erased culture and censorship, then how do you strategize? How do you, right? So there should be a bill of rights for the arts, <laughs> cultural rights. Go ahead, I, uh, Lori, I'm sorry. I think that I think that both things are true, which is part of the paradox that we're in. So when I started Mokata 25 years ago, I really founded Mokata because I felt like there were so few spaces and places to see in Brooklyn, New York, 
Black culture, African diaspora art, contemporary art, right? And so 25 years ago, I felt that that was the case where the mainstream institutions were not typically showing local Brooklyn Black artists, right? So I took that on. But I would say 25 years later, and now the commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs, <clears throat> in visiting so many of the mainstream institutions, you know, there may, <clears throat> there may be a cancel culture on one hand, but then on another extreme end, many of the institutions, mainstream institutions in New York City have diversified their collections, have diversified the artists that they're showing. Many are doing much of the work that we started out doing 25, 30, and 50 years ago because it has become not only popular, but it's also adhering to the demand that exhibitions and collections and programming reflect the diversity of the cities in which they reside. So then the question becomes, I feel more so, how do organizations of color who were originally doing this work maintain their relevance, maintain their audiences, um, continue to attract resources? Because in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement, it became very avant-garde immediately following to put resources into organizations of color to answer the cry at that time. But now people are starting to go back to their regular funding cycles or um, their new initiatives and that, that sort of dynamic. So I think it's really critical that we continue to discover ways to remain, I don't wanna say relevant, but I wanna say, that we continue to find ways to remain competitive, right? And I think part of remaining competitive is to be able to offer our staff, our team, our volunteers, our interns, many of the same opportunities that the larger institutions have, like healthcare. Um, you know, if, if they have the ability to get a higher salary and health benefits somewhere else, they're gonna take that. So. Part of what I feel like our needs have to be is to say, how can we make our work environment and cultural institutions competitive with the larger ones? And that needs to be a large part of the asks um, that we put forward as well, so that cultural um, professionals feel that they are valued, that working in a large scale institution or working at a community based institution should not be the difference of you deciding whether you could pay your rent or not pay your rent or to be able to pl plan for your family. You know, you shouldn't have to say, I wanna have a family so I can no longer work at this community-based institution. I've gotta to make tough choices and go to the larger institution. That's part of the fear um, that many people that work in community-based institutions feel. So I think we need to address those issues so that our communities can feel more whole and, our, and, and those cultural uh, workers and, and, and professionals well, have an where, opportunity. Well, that's where support. Robert Lee has it right, because the issue is equity. If mm -hmm. I can't afford to, to pay a, a full salary mm -hmm. with benefits because right. the money we get from, the, from government and the money we get from private sources is not equitable. I give so, you one even better. When you leave an institution like how I leave an organization and go off to do the next thing, our salary levels as executive directors and founders were so low exactly. that when you need to bring in the next level, the next generation, and they discover how much money you were making with no benefits and no health insurance, exactly. nobody wants to do it. Exactly. <laughs> Crazy that you were doing that? Yes, I was. Exactly. That's where Sarah's point and um, Mina's point becomes critical, right? How do we get the level of resources? Because if you're duplicating the work that I've been doing, let's say for 25 years or 50 years or whatever, and you're getting more money to do that work than my institution doing it for 25 and 50 years, I can't afford to pay uh, insurance. I can't afford to right. pay you a full salary. So here's where, the, where Barbara Lee got it absolutely correct. Where's That's the right. equity? Where's the equity? Right. Right? And, mm -hmm. I, and all power to them and, you know, transparency. We get funded by the Mellon Foundation. But they just did the Money Over the Project of paying artists. And artists are getting medical care and insurance covered and money, mm -hmm. a, a fair salary to do their work. 
And <laughs> that's the WPA the model. That's the, mm -hmm. like, you know what I'm saying? And that that's critical because then you can have the artist that is working with you, you know, you, you could pay them a, a salary. But if we don't have the, if the money is not coming in, we can't do that. Well, right? I would there's say no equity. The onus, though, shouldn't be on Not the community us. organization that's been there for 20 and 50 years. Like exactly. the onus should be on the established organization that has all the the funding co funder contacts, and you know whether or not they've been doing this work for you know any amount of time, they're able to write the grant and get a million bucks, uh, and and don't pass any of that money down to the organization that's been doing the work forever, and that's where I think there is also a problem in our ecosystem is that, you know, the organizations that have not been doing this work should not be taking up those resources. And, it, and if they do have the ability to access those resources, then they should flow some of that back to the organizations that have been doing it. And, and also, Mina I, and, and Marta, I, I think it's a, we have another challenge as well. And uh, because when we start to think, where do we get the funds from? I always think about the the huge Dominican community in Washington Heights, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the bodega owners, and I have those those amazing people, hardworking, that may contribute and may work with us in this. But this is very important to think now on the role of education and knowledge transmission in this moment, because I cannot expect that my communities uh, would would be reciprocal if I don't give something to them. I think this is a very it's like the egg and the and the hen story. I don't know mm -hmm. how to deal with that because yes, you have to give something back. We, you have to start working with the education. We have to know ourselves. We have to know ourselves and recognize our, ourselves and our place of enunciation. Where do we speak from? And to tell the bodeguero in, in, in 160 in, in Amsterdam that we are as well Caribbeans, that we are surrounded by water, that we shared an island, that we are bipolar. Yes, we are. We are bipolar in, 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 island, island but, but that's what we are. We have to live in that complexity. We cannot even deny it or anything. We have to live in that complexity that is Trinidad, that is Surinam. Because Mina looks, I, I talk to Mina and, and I feel that I, uh, all the elements from the advocacy that is so necessary, as somebody was saying that one mm -hmm. of the, the person that is looking at us, Brown was saying, I mean, Marielle Brown, I don't remember her name. Uh, I, I see what Mina is doing is uh, that kind of advocacy, that kind of supporting, because we have to make a network of um, support that includes education, knowledge of oneself, uh, and uh, uh, law, knowing of the law, and, and I think may, most of all, caring for each other as we are a complex community. Well, this is where the issue of censorship is so critical, right? Because what's the public school system in our countries? A voice for for colony, right? Mm -hmm. It's a voice for colony. It's not a voice for our communities. Anytime I've been involved with a project for the state education department in the States, that starts with multiculturalism, diversity or whatever. Once we develop the curriculum, it gets filed in the, in the garbage, right? Because <laughs> you're not supposed to be talking about you as you, right? right? And your heroes and your sheroes. You're supposed to, you know, put it down or melt it down. What is, what is this uh, erased culture about? How does uh, Toni Morrison's book, gets pull, uh, Beloved, get pulled off the, the library shelves? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, a, that's what we have to access. That. So how does that get pulled out of the library shelf in 2022? That says it all. Because any of your books, any of my books are going to get pulled. Mm -hmm. Any of your scholarship 
any of your writings, your poetry is going to get pulled. Mm -hmm. Right? So I'm, I'm really not understanding how the outcry on that is not more. Right? Because when your voice is silenced, what do you have? Right? And our voice is being silenced. So we can talk about education, but if the education is the same one that it has been for the past 500 years, what's the point? Mm -hmm. What's right. the point? It's an education at this era going against ourselves. It's an education that has taught us not to love ourselves and honor ourselves and honor our history and our ancestors. So we can't have an education like that, right? What is the bringing down these statues, Confederate statues, right? And I agree with that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because it, it, they represent a false history of what the United States is. So how do we then, and I don't say replace it because I don't want, I don't want to look like the people who oppress us or speak like the people who oppress us. But how do we uh, develop a, an educational process that is inclusive of the stories of us all? Which is what Mina was talking about, right? If we're grounded in community, it's the story of whose experience is, right? That it has to be told. Not yours, not mine, but the experience that we bring, that they bring to the table. And we don't have that as yet. We but don't. I think what Mina said was really powerful in that, in terms of a bill of rights of some sort, or you know, something that we float out there should be along the lines of if mainstream organizations are going to get funding to represent, tell the stories, include artists of color, then that then goes to Martha Vega's point in terms of Dr. Vega's point in terms of how do we make sure if you're getting funding that an organization that was doing that work as well also gets funded to do a collaborative partnership so that that work needs to come together as a financial partnership and not the mainstream organization re-granting the funding to the quote unquote smaller budgeted museum but granting both organizations funding to do this okay. collaboration together if they're going to do that work, because that answers the question that you were asking earlier, what do these collaborations look like? I, I've learned in so many ways that m most times things are not going to happen unless they're mandated or there mm -hmm. or there's a bill or legislation. You know, things don't happen because people feel good about it. I mean, and when that does happen, it's temporary. So it's like some things have to be enforced in a way that seems counterintuitive but you know or, th or certain policies have to be put or certain demands have to be made and i think that that's a strong one i i think this is where the public uh, as sarah was saying uh, public government comes in mm -hmm. right uh because then how if that that is should be the model right in a democracy that should be the model to say well where's equity in the distribution of money where is mm -hmm. equity in the fact that X amount of dollars did not go to St. Croix after the hurricane and it should have gone. Mm -hmm. Right? Who raises that? That has to be government. But when you're under a colonial government or an increasingly fascist government, right? can I just Who offer? Can I offer that part of it? So, one of the things that, like, I, I go back to the power of place, right? So, mm -hmm. Um, as the smallest territory colony, um, you know, policy is one of those things that's just been vexing for us. Like we're so small, like who advocates on our behalf? How do we shift policy? Like, so that's been an exercise. We've gone down that path. It's not a fruitful path for us. And what we have started to recognize is that there is power. Power already exists. And how do you harness that power in the places where, our grassroots organizations exist. And so we, we have really been working, when I talked about systems change, about how do you build, how do you build new systems from the ground up? How do you bypass old systems instead of trying to 
fix and alter and edit the systems that exist when you have no power to actually move policy. And so when, when we think about like the, the organizations that are grassroots organizations that are doing really, really important work around cultural arts, around education and building the requisite sort of like competencies that they need around collaboration, around resilience, around systems thinking or systems rethinking, like we are already seeing shifts happening. We are already seeing new systems being built. And so I, I think there, there are different ways to come at it. If you have the power, you have lobbying, you know, capacity, that's great. Then, you know, use that to, to the nth degree. If you don't, there are still other mechanisms that we can use to, to, to power these organizations, to allow them to understand that they already have power. You talk about local government, local government is the people, right? And so if you are building, um, the skill sets that 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 the grassroots organizations need to, to harness their power to deploy that power, um, we can start building those new systems. When you talk about education, we are like we work with the Department of Education and school system. We made investments to try to like you know ensure that arts and you know arts education was like you know a priority. That was a that was a colossal failure. We are now working with grassroots education grassroots organizations that have access to the same children. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. and that are doing almost more powerful, deeply impactful work from a different angle and a different perspective. So I just think it's really about, like, it's about using what we already have access to when mm -hmm. we talk about assets and framing those assets and, measure, and really doing an inventory on what we have already in our communities. I think that's another area that we as, as community activists and community organizers have the ability to, to shift um, the path that, you know, our communities are, are moving down. So that's just, an, I think, a, another perspective for us as a very small, uh, you know, colony. We have to think differently about, like, how do you, how do you move systems than just through policy? So that's just, uh, that's, you know, one of the things that we're doing at the foundation. Well, I mean, when you think about policy, like policy is oftentimes like it's a lagging thing, right? Like a policy is meant to codify a norm. And I think part of like what it is that we're talking about is that the norms need to change. Like it can't be, it, 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 like, it needs to be considered like against a code of conduct or against a norm for a mainstream organization, for example, to take up all the space and not share that with, with others. And, and I think there is a way also that you can put forth a set of norms without even before it gets codified into law and that ends up influencing culture you know it, it 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 feeds the public debate around this and that i think is also really powerful that goes to your point diana that you know there's there people themselves i mean democracy is you know it's it's, it's the public square and then what the public square does with that conversation to then change policy and so how how do we influence like you know the way that people go about doing this so that we um so that it's 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 not it's not okay, you know, to 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 act that kind of way in in an ecosystem, right? And where it becomes a, like almost second like nature, or even funders. Let's say funders, they when they get in a grant, they can ask, "What organizations are you working with that um, that you know are in that community?" And and so there's there's ways that you know we can build that into the process as well. Wonderful. We have a series of questions, so Olga is going to post them, and whoever feels moved to answer or respond to the question, please do so. If not, I'll assign somebody. <laughs> but I, I would hope that uh, you'll jump in. Well, that's that. That's yes. that's a. Uh, you want to go, Sarah? No, no go ahead. I, I, I I read one that is says that is is a Pan Afro Caribbean Alliance 
a possibility as we move forward? Well, um, any alliance is a possibility. Uh, actually, um, the alliance is a need, much more than a possibility. But because it's with meaningful exchange, like the one that we have, is that we can go forward and we can talk about this. I think that's a possibility, one of, of many, of many that we should. But any alliance or any structured um, endeavor to, to put together this kind of thought, that has to take into account uh, the context the political context, the laws, everything that we have spoken today, because it, because it's not only uh, how we approach culture, is uh, uh, but also how we deal with culture. That includes politics, of course. So I don't know if uh, uh, my English is not as articulated, and I said something so poetic in Spanish, but I don't know. But and and anything, <laughs> <wonderful>. anything. <laughs> Anything that we have to think as an alliance had to 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 deal with it, with education has to deal with a dialogue with with politics with society with decolonization uh, in terms of a, a, a broader aspect um, and it has to be nomadic and it has to be also uh, it has to deal with emotions because we have to heal ourselves and, and know ourselves. It's, this is something that I have learned through my life that is, you cannot do anything if you don't actually know yourself as a human from a, a diasporic descent, a Caribbean, and to believe that Caribbean, it's not only this, the, this kind of globalization before globalization, but it's also everywhere. It's not a territorial space. It's not a territorial affiliation. It's, it's everywhere. I wanted to address, address, I saw two questions come up. This one in regards to the BIPOC addressing st structural, racism, stru structural racism, even when the orgs are reactionary or have history of posturing over action. I just find that generalization like wildly problematic in yeah. the sense of, you know, saying that these organizations are posturing over action. It reminds me very often when I would, you know, go to speak to legislators or funders about needing funding for the museum. And they would say like, you're always playing the race card. You're always playing the race card. It's like, I'm not playing a race card. This is the reality that I live in. And I think to make, broad sweeping generalizations right. about what organizations of colors, particularly BIPOC, and we talk a lot about these words like BIPOC and black and brown communities and minority communities, like I think we should reference the specific organization, the specific cultural groups that we're talking about individually versus lumping them all into one group. I think that because we've faced colonization, transatlantic slavery, um, genocide and all of these different things. It doesn't always mean that we are all always on the same page, but I do think that it's important that we be intentional about coming together to speak about the issues that we're facing so that we can come up with commonalities. But for someone, for, for funders or grantors to say that these BIPOC, you know, Black indigenous I, people of color. I don't use that term at all. That's right? a no no term. That's a sense of the Alana term. or those. <laughs> those if you, are if you umbrella That's all, imagine umbrellaing all of those organizations and saying that they are posturing over action and that they should not be allocated funding because of how they all function is like really dangerous. So I wouldn't even. We and it shouldn't be radical versus neoliberal organizations. It should be who has a track record of getting the work done, who's having an impact, who's doing work to move the needle. Let's evaluate each organization by the organization. And the second one about Pan Africanism, Caribbean Pan African Alliance happen. Let me say that that needs to be our and for every generation, their lifelong work. 
You know, it can't, it's, it can't be, we got together next year and we did a conference and there was that, this isn't got to be an intentionality that our children inherit and our children's children inherit because it's just the lifetime of work that we have to do. One, to unravel the atrocities that have happened to us by coming back together, which is a lifetime of work, but also for our empowerment as a people um, to continue to work together, collaborate together. And if we're not intentional about it, if we think it's a one-time thing versus our life's work, um, it's not gonna be impactful or effective. We always have to be um, creating that impact together. Yeah, sweeping statements are not, not acceptable. I mean, we, we need to, um, we need to really look at how we can form a sustainable alliances mm -hmm. because I mean, uh, I've done several over time and the question is always is how do we sustain them? That's right. right? How do we sustain them? Do we have the staff, the, the bandwidth to sustain them? It's not that they haven't happened before. The question is how do we sustain them and how do we frame, uh, uh, a system or a strategy for making sure that they're, as you said, Lori, continuous, and mm -hmm. we can pass that on and that work on continuously. Is another question up? Does anybody want to respond? Somehow I'm not seeing the question that you all seem to be reading. I think it was it's, it was a, a common yes. There's a lot of uh, offerings to to participate in some uh, ecosystem that's amazing. We love that. Um, <laughs> yes, I don't yeah. see any. I have a question. Yes. Is there some okay. sort of, because I've been a bit out of the loop, is there some sort of African diaspora cultural leaders conference that happens on an annual basis? Is there something that brings all of the people together, um, cultural leaders of the African diaspora together for some sort of conference? Not to my no. knowledge. No. I think and there is actually. I think yeah. there is. <laughs> we, um, I think, I think it's um, in part hosted by CARICOM. So I think there is something that happens in oh, the Caribbean. Caribbean. Something that happens in the Caribbean and one of our our colleagues who's part of our consortium attends it on an annual basis. So and there are uh, African and Caribbean, so it is Pan-African uh, leaders that come together. Oftentimes it's in South America or somewhere um, in like Trinidad, the, the larger um, and the I, I don't know the name of it, but I know the Black the Trustees Alliance, the Black yes. Trustees um, Alliance, does anybody know what that is? I don't know what it is. No, and recent, uh, last month, two months ago, we had in Puerto Rico the Cumbre Afro, a summit that uh, people from the Hispanic uh, African diaspora came to Puerto Rico to, to talk about uh, Afro descendant uh, issues, reality, et cetera. But it, that was the first one again, that happened. Again, uh, Maricela and Diana, this is something so uh, there, it's even an, uh, anecdotal because it's, it's circumstantial. It's so happens one time, and that's the problem with that. That, um, that there are so many different efforts and interests and agendas that to put it together. First of all, I have a problem with uh, Caricom because Caricom is not necessarily the, the whole Caribbean. Actually, I'm there, I'm, I'm there. We are there like a Haiti and the Dominican Republic because some sort That's one of, of our leaders, so like, Dr. Chen, yes, she's. Some sort of a, a miracle from the mm -hmm. angels. But 
but yes we have to to start thinking about uh, this kind of alliances because it has to be also a, an economical uh, political alliance as well because this is not something you can on, only uh, can transform in in cultural terms because sometimes there's uh, there's another agendas that are actually backfiring to you and as a, as Lori said if we don't do this if we don't do this as our life work we have betray ourselves we have been doing this for as long as i can remember i've been working with this so i think this we owe that to not only to our ancestors but we owe that to our children and our mm -hmm. Our grandchildren and mm -hmm. it to our region we owe that and That's yes right. mm -hmm. so yeah. what would the next steps be before we close what are the recommendations that we can make to uh realize a As sustainable a, a sustainable <laughs> strategic way of sustainable yeah sustainable and strategic um, and systems uh, appropriate if to use, uh, I, I don't know if appropriate is the term, but I like uh, Deanne's look at systems, right? And in order for, I think, a success to happen, we have to look at it differently because we may have to be able to sustain it in ways that it's not looking for outside funding. Right, because the network I did with Latin America and the Caribbean through Hunter College uh, was wonderful and impactful. And many of the participants became officials in their governments, but we couldn't sustain it because it was really based on funding. So how do we sustain it? You know, using the ants thinking of finding ways of finding the power within that if somebody pulls the funding plug, it continues anyway. Uh, as one of our viewers, Mariel Barrow, that has been very active. Thank you, Mariel, for being there. <laughs> uh, advocacy, yeah. Advocacy yeah. is very important. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> and as, as she said, uh, we have to make an alliance. And I think we have to, the first thing I think we have to continue doing is to meet and to produce thought and to to write <laughs> and to to archive to to keep history alive that's something no well no one will take that from us if we if we systematize and 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 give prevalence to archiving and to write about this i was thinking the other day about the importance of the Caribbean exhibitions in terms of perception of Caribbean culture. And I decided, I said, okay, I'm gonna write this. I'm gonna start from that 1952 uh, festival in San Juan, Puerto Rico, till uh, Havana Biennials, Carifestas and everything. So what happened to that? Why it was doomed? Because they were doomed. So it is, it is very interesting. And I said, I have to write down I have to write down this. I have to research and I have to produce thought. That's the only thing I can do at this moment. I think it's very important for all of us to, to continue thinking and to share what we think about a region and the problems that we confront. I think it would be great to have some sort of virtual African diaspora conference to just start off with. I mean, what you're doing right here, Martha, to expand yeah. this to like at least an annual gathering of people and cultural leaders specifically um, from throughout the African diaspora to meet, to, to talk even beyond issues of funding, but everything from exhibition ideas to best practices at our institutions, how many have come up with creative solutions to addressing the pandemic, to all kinds of, um, you know, our internship programs, youth training, workforce development concepts. Um, someone's also talking about presentations of white papers. Like it would be really exciting to see a, a space where we create some sort of conference virtually for the time being 
that just brings together, I would be fascinated to hear about all of the different spaces globally where cultural leaders are and hear about what's happening in their perspective countries um, and what's happening on the exhibition side as well. Mm. I also think that one of the things that takeaways, at least for me, for this conversation, is that we support Barbara Lee's uh, um, congressional initiative mm -hmm. in terms of, of it, it, it's an initiative, right? It's a bill that she's putting forward. Right. And that we make a commitment to support it and find out more about it and how we can be supportive. And I also like the idea of a bill of yeah, art rights. Yeah, I love the idea of bill of rights. <laughs> I think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, th I think that we need to look at that because um, it, uh, people who are, are rendering support need to understand that um, people taking our voice, because that's what it is. You know, like if you duplicate the work and you don't have people representing those cultures or, or, or the group that you're talking about, right? Then you're doing a sort of an anthropological study. You're not doing an, a, a, a cultural art exhibition, right? Because you don't have the people on your staff that represent the cultures that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And therefore that is uh, co-optation, right? And even if you have someone who, let's say, speaks Spanish or whatever, and doesn't come from the experience, that's also problematic. So that you have to understand who you have as curators. You have to understand uh, what the uh, role of this work has been over time for equity, for presence, for um, equity, right, uh, of reframing of disempowerment and disenfranch disenfranchisement. Um, and not just say because you have a Puerto Rican exhibition or because you have a Latina show that you did it, right? What you did was be able to draw resources that we could never draw and not necessarily want to draw because we don't have the size spaces to hold certain things and that's real that's where the collaboration comes in because when we did the met we did the the exhibition at el museo del barrio but when it went to the met it was even larger because of the space we didn't have the space so that collaboration is necessary because we're in a different space a different time and the country is different let me jump in on this right <laughs> why don't we ask or invite Congress member Barbara Lee to come to this forum and open it back up and she talked more about great. the legislation. That would be she, great. <laughs> wouldn't that be awesome? We yep. will do that. We, will, okay. we shall do Amazing. that together. We shall I'm gonna do see that if, together. I'm going to see if this commissionership title has any juice and I'll reach out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we are counting on you, Laurie. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. I think that would be I think that would be an awesome next step to invite her and to begin to create a coalition because we could just be assuming, you know, she puts out a powerful uh, bill like this and we think she's flooded. I mean, she may not be. And it may be important for her to have collaborators and partners all throughout Absolutely. the African diaspora mm -hmm. who are advocating for this. So it would be a missed opportunity if we continue to just talk about it, but not talk directly to her so and to let her know that she has allies in this work. Yeah, because mm -hmm. most of the groups that sign, signed off on it are from California. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that to make it national and international would be awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, I think yeah. now is exactly the right moment because as you were saying earlier, I mean, art is a part of democracy, the democratic process. And I think in that sense, you know, bills like this actually put resources behind the kinds of conversations that we need to be having in order to, to like really face, you know, the, the hard questions that are, are before us right now. And I just want to offer that as we think about collaboration, and I say this as, you know, one of the fundamental roles of the foundation as a convener, is that you talked about, Marta, you talked about uh, sustainability and the root of sustainability is that um, you know the, the the people who are in the midst of it own 
the agenda, that it, mm -hmm. they have some agency in the agenda, and trust. Um, and so there's a lot of work that those of us in the Caribbean have to do to build trust. You know, when we talk about the role of CAR CARICOM is, a, is the appropriate convener to bring the people that come to that convening together. They are for that, that convening. And if we don't recognize that for all the, the, the diversity and complexity within this colonial space of, of this region in the Caribbean, that we've got work to do to build um, coalitions that have staying power, um, that that work has to be part of this. We can't just say that, you know, those of us who sat in this room today have an agenda um, and um, haven't stopped to think about who else belongs in this conversation Whoa. and how do we invite them into this conversation to make exactly. sure that they have ownership in this work. And so I, I offer that as sort of one of the things that I think we need to prioritize as we think about our next steps. Absolutely. And I, I have to I have to uh, point out uh, Chinsida Kahina, who is- Yes, she's one, of our, she's one of our nonprofit yeah. partners. She's amazing. <laughs> yeah. because, uh, the, the the comment says that the Caribbean Pan African Network and all the Pan African organizations with select focus on art, culture, heritage, and environment work collaboratively with other cultural creative within the region. And he, he mentions the Emancipation Support Committee of Trinidad Tobago uh, and many other. And later on, talk about the Caribbean Studies Association, which is very important because we have to think of on, on the academics, that's very important. And it's a welcoming space of, for many of these issues, as Shenzira said. So keep that in mind, the University mm -hmm. of Western, uh, West Indies mm -hmm. is amazing in doing that. And I have to, for, for, to the end, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Vega, but, but uh, John Stephen said that, uh, that uh, he's uh, very happy to see me here Mm -hmm. in a pan-Caribbean, pan-Africa discussion because he is very worried about the how the nationalists in DR have been very hostile to against Haitian citizens. I would say to Mr. Stevens that I'm very proud to be here and also that not only they're hostile to uh, Haitian citizens, but to everybody that do, do, do not think about uh, immigration or migration processes as them. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm totally against that group, of course. And thank you so much for yeah. seeing thank me you. here being a, a good thing. Thank you, Marta, for hosting, uh, hosting this talk. Yes, Marta. Oh, no, Marie thank you all Mena. for participating. And I'd thank like to so ask much. Mina if she would help us put together a Bill of Rights. If we can mm -hmm. think about it from the from uh, that, <laughs> that lens, yeah. Me too. Is that a possibility? I mean, we'll talk. We can, we can talk. We can talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so very much, and thank, thank you. Uh, the participants, and thanking the people who have tuned in uh, to this conversation because it's a conversation that will continue. We need mm -hmm. to look at a changing uh, environment in terms of racial and cultural groups we need to look mm -hmm. at the issue of trying to silence us by uh putting a fear about being cultural we are cultural and culture is what keeps us alive it gives us our spirit it gives us our breath it gives us our values it gives us our ethics and each of us uh represent people of ethics and people of value so that culture is at the center of who we are. It's not to be erased. So thank you, ladies. Thank, thank you. you. Thank so you, everybody. Much, All much right. love. Bye. Bye-bye.